All right. It looks like we are live. We're uh, rolling it a few minutes early today to let people file in, and we're going to update some links live on the Creative Cloud Facebook page. So I will uh, do another introduction in just a moment. But thank you so much for joining me. Live from Amsterdam, as you can see. Well, you can't really see. Uh, all right. So, as always, uh, we've got our live interactive chat. All right, I'm just going to give it a couple more seconds here. Sure, we are good to go. There we are. Kevin Monahan. All right, there's my comments. What is up? David, Jenny, Chris, Roxanne. Thank you so much for that. Very nice to see you. And uh, all right, it's just gone six o'clock, so I'm going to. Uh, Officially start and officially introduce. All right. <laughs> very, very cool. Well, once again, thank you so much for joining me today, live from Amsterdam, talking to you about new features coming to the next updates of your favorite Creative Cloud video and audio tools, talking about Premiere Pro, After Effects, Audition, Adobe Media Encoder, and of course, uh, Adobe Character Animator. What is up, Latilda? What's up, Mike, James? So uh, we're going to be together for about an hour, and uh, if you were not able to catch the entire presentation today, uh, you'll be able to watch the replay, of course, right here on the Creative Cloud Facebook page, and uh, you'll probably be able to watch this later uh, tomorrow or certainly later in the week uh, on the Creative Cloud YouTube channel as well. So we've got a lot of stuff to cover, a lot of new features in these applications. You know, it just seems like we just released, right? We just updated just a few months back, and it seems like we were doing a live stream around NAB in Las Vegas back in April. Well, here we are six months later, and one of the things we're really going to talk about and focus on is time, and how with this release we've really done a lot of features and a lot of things to save you time, to maximize your time, to speed up the processes of things that you do, common tasks and things, just to really get that time back so you can free up more time for, a, for, uh, for creativity. Does that sound like marketing language? Absolutely. Is it true? Yes. Well, hopefully you'll see that coming through. Now, I, hey, what's up? Vanessa, what's up? Yuri, what's up? Alvaro, Jonathan. Hey, hey, Duke Williams, what's happening, man? So now, again, this is a live interactive chat. Now, I've got probably 50-some features to try and show you uh, within an hour. So um, I'm going to go through this fairly briskly. And we've got quite a few uh, Adobe people in the chat who will also be answering your questions. So I'll be, I'll be peeking over, but... I might not see them all, but they're there. And Kevin Monahan, one of our main main dudes, he's in the chat as well, so he'll be able to uh, respond to your questions if I don't see them. And uh, shall we get to it? Are you guys ready? All right. Hey, serious. Here, three hundred and sixty. What's happening, Nils? Hey. Okay. All right. So we're going to start in Premiere Pro. And actually, what I thought we would do is um, rather than get, <laughs> it's not like I want to make you wait, but rather than get into all the heavy things and some of the things which you may have already seen online, I thought it would be really cool just to kind of show you some of the little things and specifically some of the user requests that Kevin and many of us see on the forums daily, things that you've been asking for, things that you know, maybe you've been asking for for quite some time, or things that, again, can just make your day, your edit better, faster, more efficient. And something that I just got asked not even two weeks ago when we were doing an, uh, an Adobe Live uh, stream from San Francisco around video and motion design was the ability to simply close gaps automatically, instantly, inside the timeline. So if you take a look at the sequence that I have here, you can see that I've laid this out. This is actually an episode from one of our Make It shows. Make It is available uh, for viewing on YouTube as well, where we feature creatives from all around the world in all different disciplines and photography and motion design and video and illustration, etc. And uh, we started to put together the edit, and we've left you know, a whole bunch of holes here 
where we're probably going to insert some different shots or some B-roll, whatever it is, right? Commonly, right, as you're sort of assembling things, you might place gaps, and you may eventually fill those gaps or not. So if you want to, you know, if you want to suddenly uh, uh, close all the gaps, how do you do that? Or how did you do that previously? Well, there wasn't a really smooth, easy way to just automatically do it. Well, now we've done it. And if you go up to the sequence menu, you're going to see that towards the bottom there, we've got a new feature, a new function, close the gap. Yes, now by default, this does not have a keyboard shortcut assigned. You can see that I've used Alt-G here for that. So if you don't have anything selected at all, let's just assume that I want to close all the gaps in this sequence. I'm simply going to hit Alt-G, and that's it. Gaps closed. <laughs> Simple, easy, elegant, nice. Now, what if you've got specific sections that you've been working on? You're like, okay, you know what? I'm not going to fill in any of this. All these pieces go together. I can make a selection here. Again, Alt-G or just use whatever keyboard shortcut you do. And there we've closed the gap for that section. Again, I can come over to here, do it again. You get the idea. So a simple, easy, efficient way to close the gaps. I was just working with one of our influencers and she had asked me about this. I was asking me about the shortcuts for just kind of slipping and sliding things together and I just said, ah, I'm such a short, I'm, I'm terrible at shortcuts, but I wish we had it so that we could close the gaps. Now we do. Coming soon. So this is a fantastic one. Now, as you're looking at this timeline, for those of you who are paying close attention to the visuals on screen, did you notice something different about the waveforms here? Did you notice something different about just the labeling? There seems to be a lot of color on screen, more color than you're used to. Yes, more color labels, because if we go up to preferences, labels, probably again in the top 10 feature requests, give us more labels and give us more label colors. Now you'll see, rather than eight, we offer 16 label colors that you can now, of course, rename, modify, set as defaults, so you can choose which of the 16 you use for whatever it is that you want. And of course, you can customize these enti entirely. I was just talking to a user recently on Twitter, and they said, oh, how do I, I don't really love the colors. Oh, well, you can just change them. If you click inside, of course, you go to your color picker, and you can modify it just as if you were in Photoshop. So label colors. Again, it's the simple little things, but it's one more way to stay organized, to keep things clean, to keep things together. Um, and it also just looks super cool, right? <laughs> There's a lot, it's cool. There's like tan and teal, you know, you could, you could change all of these however you want. All right, now as we're gonna be moving around today, um, again, I'm on a remote setup here, so I might be reconfiguring my workspaces um, and it's not uncommon, I mean, I think for all of us that as we work, as we're doing things, you know, uh, we start moving panels around, changing panels around. I think I was reading something in one of the uh, Twitter comments about the new features saying, yeah, my, you know, my UI never looks like this. It's always custom. It's always all over the place. And that's fine. That's cool. That's how we work. And then if you want to reset your workspace, you could always do that. But it meant going up to window workspace, okay, here's the workspace we're in, reset to save layout, click through an OK box, and then it resets. Wouldn't it be nice if you could simply go up to the workspace bar at the top here and double click on editing? Now, I've always got this on to always ask, but are you sure you want to just go ahead and set it back to normal? Yes, and in a single click, it does it. Or in the case of this one, IBC Live Start, there it is there, do the same thing, reset it to its layout and we're good to go. So these simple little tweaks, you know, again, we did a study years ago, one of these Pfeffer studies about the number of clicks it takes to get from point A to point B. And something like that was six clicks. Now it's a double click. And if you remove that always ask option, it's just a double click, right? Which is super cool. Okay, so now we're gonna start getting into the heavy things, the heavy lifting. Hey, what's up, Mike Russell? Love the pretty colors indeed. Um, so now we're going to get into some of these really cool things that we've done to, again, make your life easier. And the first thing I'm going to talk to you about is something called multiple open projects. And I'm going to start actually doing just that. So what this is, is this is really ideal for a single editor. And what this allows you to do is basically, if you're looking, it gives you basically a way to sort of look at a linear progression of scenes or episodes um, or any way to really just break down all of your, all of your scenes in a, into like smaller entities. So what we're doing here is I've got a whole bunch of different episodes from our Make It show. And what, I, what we're wanting to do is to cut these together into a little uh, stinger, a little, little sort of trailer for Make It. So I'm going to go open up 
the teaser that we've been building as well. And keep in mind, this is something that you just you could not do before. You did have ways to bring in uh, project files, but of course everything was entirely read-only. This is fully editable, and these are three live projects now, all living simultaneously, all at the same time. Okay. So what I want to do is we're going to start by going into this teaser. So again, this is a teaser based around this Make It show. I'm just going to mute the audio here for a second. And you can see I've got a little gap down at the bottom where I wanted to drop in a clip from this episode with, uh, with Brooke and Paul. Okay, So I happen to know where that is. So what I can do is I'm simply going to take this. I'm going to twirl down the footage from Brooke and Paul's uh, show. I'm going to grab this clip here. Actually, let me just go ahead and uh, I'll stick it up here first so I can shrink this up. All right. Let's go ahead and shrink that. All right. And let's go ahead and place that in the gap down here. All right, so I'll take my piece of content, drag it in there like that, go ahead and wind this back. And let's see what we got. Okay, now you're thinking to yourself, ah, eh, that's not so great. Ah, it is great though, because by dragging this footage into this teaser project, what it's also done now is it's added a reference to that footage to this teaser project. What's significant here is that it did not recopy or move the media, it's just the reference, all right? So you can freely do that. Additionally, it's again really nice if you think about sort of cutting documentaries or something, this kind of workflow where you can have effectively, for lack of a better word, a sort of master project and then each 20, 30 minute vignette can have its own project. What does this do for you? Well, it allows you to, one, have smaller projects. That means faster saves. It means faster auto saves. It means faster loading. Um, and you can do incredible things with this. Let's say that I actually wanted to bring in, let me go ahead and float this for a second. I'm going to undock this panel. Let's say that uh, in this Paul and Brooke, what I actually want to bring in that, that timeline with the gaps in there. Well, I can actually take the sequence itself. I can drop the sequence in here and all of the media and all the references to that media come into that teaser project as well. All right. You don't have to copy things over. You don't have to move things over. It's going to keep it lean and clean and fast. This was one of those things that people have been asking for and now you've got it. So this is a feature called multiple open projects. Absolutely cool. Again, for fast turnarounds without creating any media management overhead or frustration, it's clean, it's lean, it's awesome. Now, taking that a step further, what about working collaboratively? Well, you'll know that we have something called Team Projects, and in fact, it's pretty cool that we're able to announce, actually at IBC this week, um, that Team Projects is officially 1.0. Well, uh, on top of that, though, that is a whole different level of collaboration. We now are offering something to the end user, to the CCI or CC individual user, called shared projects. And this really offers a productive workflow for organizing productions when you're working over like shared local storage. Okay? So this is a really powerful way to basically lock your projects and assign collaborative roles, and then people can all access this if they're working on your local, uh, your local network here. And you think about this like you know, if you've got craft editors and assistants working together um, this is a really easy way for them to access the same content. So it starts um, by first enabling collaboration. So if we go up to Premiere Preferences Collaboration here, my hair dropping all over my laptop, you'll see that we have this function to enable project locking. And then each user that logs in will give themselves a name. So in this case, I just chose Edit Bay 1. Um, each user logs in. Now, when you click OK on that, you'll notice down at the bottom here, and I'm going to try and zoom in so you can see it. Oh, there we go. Oops. Hold on. Just went to my screensaver. That was stupid. All right. You can see this little green lock icon right here, and it's telling you, <laughs> I, can't, I can't move down anymore. It's telling you that the project is writable. That's what that tooltip is saying right there. If I get rid of my camera for a second. Hmm. 
the project is writable. All right. So if I go ahead and lock this off now, turn my camera back on, okay, zoom back out. Oh, here, let's not do that. I don't want to save that one. If I go ahead and lock this, what it will actually do is it'll tell you and it'll tell the other users that are accessing this on your local network that this project is locked. Now, how do you see that? Well, if we go into the flyout menu here and we go into the metadata display, now this is something that I've already set up. Now, this is not on by default. You'll want to do this. I've got a couple of custom metadata schemas here, but inside the Premiere Pro project metadata schema, if we scroll down towards the bottom, you'll see that there is actually a field for project locking, all right? So by enabling that, now again, I'm logged in as myself to this, so you're not gonna see that I'm locked out of it. But this is where it would show you right here, you know, the user holding the lock, okay? And what this means is that now people are not able to edit this project. They can view it, but they can't mess it up. They can't do anything to it. What do I mean by that? Well, what happens if I just try and drag footage over? It doesn't let me move anything, you see? because it's locked, right? And this could be me sort of assembling the timeline while someone else is, again, working across multiple open projects. They're doing something else. When my work is done here, all I have to do, and again, you're, oh, you can't see me because I, I wanted to continue to show you. Let's just see, again, you've got that red icon down at the bottom there. Zoom is going all over the place today. Red icon, click that, now it's unlocked. Now we can move things freely about Okay, there I am again. Um, and it just functions as you'd expect. All right. Now, if you want to create a new shared project, under the new item bin, we have new shared project. Go ahead and give it a name. I'll call this Jason's work. Okay. And it's just as simple as that. And again, if I wanted to create a folder or a bin in here, again, I can take a sequence. Functions just the way multiple open projects did. It's going to copy um, references over for the media inside of this project here. Now, people have been asking too, in some of our pre-release, what if we actually want physical copies of the media? Well, you can still use the media browser workflow. So if you use the traditional media browser workflow, when you select media and import it into your project, it is in fact doing that. It's copying a version into your project. So you can still do something like that. And of course, there's other ways to make master copies and master clips. But all of this here, very simple, clean, lean, uh, non-destructive references and this is just a great way to work and again it's that simple it's as simple as locking the project down you'll see who's been working on it who's freed it up and you can continue moving and continue working okay so shared projects multiple open projects let's talk about some of the innovations and some of the modifications we've made uh, oh, I'm gonna close all of my projects to our essential graphics panel and motion graphics template workflows so this we premiered again at uh, NAB back in April. Huge feature, huge, huge release, and uh, something that we were really, really excited uh, to do. Oh, now why is that happening? Why not syncing? It's syncing, it's syncing. Well, let me make sure I've got, uh, make sure I've got internet here. <laughs> Bear with me for a second. Just have to re-authenticate. Okay. There we go. Okay. Look at that. You never even knew. All right. So Essential Graphics basically kind of was a, a reinvention, a reimagination of the Premiere Pro titler. But it was V1, right? And we were missing some things. So we wanted to obviously improve this, even in a, just a couple months' time, um, in such a way that, one, we brought back some features that some of you really wanted from the traditional titler, but also gave you some things that it didn't have that really apply to this, again, this concept of saving time and this modern workflow of allowing your motion graphics templates to be, re to be consistently reusable by making them responsive. Now, we know responsive is a term from web design, but what about in video? Well, the same concept applies because especially today where we're working in 16.9, if we're doing sort of traditional YouTube or Vimeo publishing, or if we're going to Instagram, maybe we're doing Square. You can also do 16.9 there. You can also do vertical, or if you're doing Snapchat, you can do vertical. Well, if you created a lower third or an essential graphic previously, and you placed it in a 16.9 timeline, and then you took that same one and placed it on a vertical timeline, 
it just, it just didn't look the same. It didn't know any better. It didn't know what to do. Well, now you have some really cool capabilities. Now, before we get to that stuff, we're going to focus on two specific types or flavors of responsive templates, responsive time and responsive position. And with regard to position, you can either do one object relative to the other or objects relative, again, to the aspect ratio or the size of the frame. So here we have a very simple timeline uh, with a show introduction. And take a quick look at this. And we've got some text that's going to fly in here with a little bit of animation. All right, it's called the vast horizon. Okay, and then it just has a brief little scale change here. Now, what I'd like to do, all right, is I would like for that text to always have that same relationship, regardless of how long I stretch that out for. So for this, we're going to focus on responsive design time. All right. So you can actually set here an intro and an outro duration. And whatever keyframed animation you make inside of those ranges, those keyframes will stay attached in those ranges at all times. Here's what I mean. All right. So if we go ahead and go into our effects controls, let me just go ahead and just Scroll this up. I think all it is is some scale keyframes. Yeah. So you can actually see the scale keyframes right here. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set an intro duration of one second and 10 frames. I'll set an outro duration of 20 frames. Okay. And now, do you see these little gray dividers? Okay. So this is showing you these are the areas where basically we're going to have responsive, time based animation. Anything that lives inside of that minute, a second, and 10 frames will always work no matter how long or short you make the video clip. Now you can see I didn't quite get those keyframes right there, so I'm going to make sure to drag them inside that outro duration. So what happens now? Well, again, if I stretch this out just a lot longer, the animation happens, stays on screen, all right? And then when we get towards the end here, again, in our final 20 frames, it goes off screen. But what if this video was super, super short? All right. Shrink this up. Notice the relationship stays the same. This will actually uh, squeeze or stretch anything that's in the middle. So you can have animation in the middle. But always you will preserve those relationships at the top and tail with that responsive design time. Now, in this case here, it's going to be super fast, okay? But it always, always works, always stays responsive, always um, respects the timing that you've sent there, that you've set there. Easy for me to say. Who's jet lagged? All right? Cool, I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up. Okay, so responsive design time. All right, so now let's take it a little step further and deal with some responsive position or object pinning. So I'm gonna go back over to my project panel here. Let's take a quick a look at, a, a quick a look. Let's take a quick look at this one. Now, this one has some, again, some basic uh, animation here. I've actually got another variation of this one that I think I'd rather use that does something a little bit more interesting by adding a little bounding box to this. So I'm going to take this Mogurt here, and I'm simply going to drag this other Mogurt, which by the way, if you're just tuning in now, Mogurt stands for Motion Graphics Template, and we're going to build one of these in just a second. All right. So in the case of this, now you can see we've got this rectangular box around the vast horizon text. And as you might guess, what I want to happen here is regardless of what's typed inside of that text frame, I want that box to stay attached to it and to reflow. And that's exactly what it does. Now you'll notice down in the clip here that we have some uh, intro duration responsive design time settings here. So those initial keyframes of the animation, you can actually see some of them are falling outside of the range there. So we could move those back in if we always wanted them to kind of respect that intro time. But if we select one of the layers here, what you'll now see inside of Essential Graphics is this is where you can actually access responsive design position. 
So here you can see that Vast Horizon is pinned simply to the video frame. You can see the little tooltip here, choose a layer, or the video frame to track all transform properties of that layer. Okay, so regardless of where we put this motion graphics template, it's always going to appear right there in the same position. But the shape layer, so this is this little white bounding box that I created, if we select that one, notice that that is pinned to the Vast Horizon text. So again, what that means, that if I were to click into the text block here, all right, and do something like that, and wind it back, note that it reflows, the animation doesn't change, everything works as expected, right? So pinning one piece of the animation to something else, responsive design, position, okay? Super easy. Same goes for font choices or changing fonts. And I bring fonts up because we've made some amazingly awesome modifications with fonts in this version too. What amazing modifications could you possibly make with fonts? Well, again, something that we heard from almost all of our users post-NAB, which is they didn't love our font menu because it was non-standard. It didn't look like Photoshop. It didn't look like Illustrator. It didn't look like InDesign. So now, when you go into text or your font choices, ta -da, now you can see we have the font menu as you'd expect with all of your various options. So first of all, you can sort, so you can show fonts from Typekit. Um, if you twirl down, if you see this is little arrows here, it'll show you all the various styles that you have of those uh, flavors of those particular fonts. You can also sort by favorites or show your favorites here, okay? And you've also got your font previews. Probably the biggest, uh, biggest comment that I heard from users when we introduced this was, how do you not give me a font preview? You know, it's, one, it's nice to be able to change it on the fly, but it's also nice to, you know, just let me see what it is. <laughs> so of course you can do that now, all right, very easily and it'll change on screen, what have you, okay? So, redesigned font menu, borrowed from Photoshop, um, so much easier, so much nicer. Okay, so let's go back now and talk a little bit about responsive uh, aspect ratios, or, you know, just kind of taking it a little step further. And I didn't realize I had my action safe, title safe, action safe margins on this whole time, that's fine. Um, the reason for that is because in this example here, we're creating a video that's going to go out to a series of social platforms. Now we're going to start here in 16.9. Again, our little vast horizon graphic here. And we've got this vast horizon text pop up. Now the reason I had the margins on here was because I wanted to alter the position of this. So if I choose the text here, once again, I'm going to, well, first of all, I'm just going to move it. So let me go ahead and grab my move tool. And I'm going to move this down just to the edge of the action safe border. Okay. And you'll see why I'm doing this visually in a moment. Now I'm going to come up to responsive design position and I want to pin it to the video frame. So regardless of the size of the video frame, the aspect ratio, I always want it to be in this position in the bottom right corner of the action safe margin. How do I want to tell it to go to the bottom right corner? Well, that's what these little pins are for. So I'm going to tell it, always orient yourself in that bottom right corner right here. All right. So again, we can play this back. You already know what it looks like. Real simple, real easy. Okay. So at this point now, I actually want to create a motion graphics template. So I can right click on this or I can go up to the graphics menu and I'm going to choose export as motion graphics template. Wow, time is almost gone. And we'll call this uh, vast H L3, it's not really a lower third, um, pin BR for pin bottom right, okay? And I'm gonna save this to one of my CC libraries. Now I could save it locally to the Essential Graphics tab inside of Premiere, um, but I want to put this in a library because I might use this on another system, or I might have this in a shared library where I want to be able to hand this off to other people. So we're going to click OK on this, and it creates our motion graphics template, and there it is, right there, vast HL3 pin BR. OK. So now, here's that same video represented in Square. Let's go ahead and take our graphic here. I'm going to wind back to the beginning. Let's take our template, drag it down. This is why I had the title safe, action safe. Boom. 
See that? See the position there? It's exactly where we had it in the 16.9 frame, but now because it's responsive, it's doing the same thing in the square frame. Mentioned before, what if we're working vertically? Okay, so let's just do uh, 1280. So we'll do like a 1280 by 1280. Okay. Oh, wait, no, not 1280 by 1280. I said vertical. Duh. 1280 by 720. Okay. No, what am I? No. 720 by 1280. This is live, you know, this is what happens. All right. Yes, thank you, about time. Get it together, Levine. Go ahead and drag this in again. What should happen? This is why I've got the, the, the margins on there. Beautiful, okay. Responsive design, motion, graphics, templates. Responsive design, time. Responsive design, position. Now, just one last little thing I just wanna show you here. Um, this is just really fun, and this kind of beautifully illustrates um, kind of in a, in, a, in a fun but simplified way what this can really do, like just to kind of give you an idea of how you can pin multiple things and, and do some crazy stuff. Now, before we start doing anything here, I'm actually just going to take this sun, you'll see why, and I'm just going to elongate it a little, a little bit because what we've got here is a, a very small depiction of the universe, where we've got the sun, we've got the solar system behind everything, we've got the sun, and we've got Venus, Earth, and the moon. Now the sun, of course, if we turn off everything just briefly here, the sun is rotating. And that's why I just kind of expanded it there, just so that you can see it's actually moving. We've got the graphic behind it as well, all right? So the sun is moving. It's pinned to the video frame. Venus is also pinned to the video frame, it too is rotating around the sun. Now we've got the Earth. The Earth is pinned to the sun, okay? And we've got the moon, and the moon is pinned to the Earth. So when we play all of this back together, all right, so you've got the sun rotating, you've got the planets rotating around the sun, and you've got the moon rotating around the planet. All right? this, didn't, this didn't take but a few seconds to author. Um, I had actually planned on swapping out those. And these were all, <laughs> these are just ellipses and, and, and uh, with, with no fill, right? With just a stroke. But you get the idea. So you can do some really, really cool things with this very, very quickly, very, very easily. Save these as templates. When they're responsive, they'll work regardless of whatever it is that you're throwing at them, whether it's 16, nine, nine by 16, one to one ratio, they will work, they will respect the space, the aspect ratio, the time, uh, the duration. And this is such a great, great new feature. We're so, so uh, glad to be able to bring this back to you uh, or bring this to you. And one other thing, which you may have seen before, uh, that people were really upset that we didn't have, which were, again, we heard you, we listened, now it's back, is the credit roll. So here we have, again, sort of end of the scene credits. You simply can enable roll in essential graphics. And then you've got your basic settings, your basic parameters, start off screen and off screen. You've got your pre-roll and post-roll, ease in and ease out. Don't have to kind of go through this whole thing because it's 632 and we got to get moving here. But if we go to the finished one, just to kind of give you an idea of what this looks like, all right, there's your credit roll, all right? And again, if we were to take this, and just go ahead and uh, shrink this up. As you'd expect, what happens when you shrink it up? Who can guess? It just scrolls that much faster, okay? It'll still respect where that beginning and end is, again, responsive design time, but it just works as you'd expect it to, all right? So the credit roll. Super cool, super easy, so glad we've got that back, all right. And it's also worth pointing out that um, if you've got your credit text that you've already authored, let's say in a Photoshop file or an Illustrator After Effects, you can actually copy paste the text into a layer inside of the um, Essential Graphics panel here and it will preserve the font and the character styles. Not everything, 
There's some things that won't carry over. Um, but fonts and character styles should. So again, wherever you're creating your credit text, pretty easy to kind of move between these formats and kind of continue to roll. All right. Oh my goodness. It's 6.33. Okay. We've got two more major things in Premiere. Uh, and then we're going to segue over to After Effects. So let's go ahead and close this project. How are we doing out here? All right. <clears throat> faster, faster. Hey, what's up? Barbara Louf. Blue F. How are you? Don't save. Okay. So let's go into, what did I just say? Oh, immersive. Okay. Now, many of you will be familiar with um, uh, the acquisition that we had of the Metal Skybox, some of the Metal Skybox plugins just a couple of months ago. Um, if you're not familiar with Metal, well, certainly if you're working in 360 or VR, you know Metal. Um, they are and have been the go-to for pretty much anybody creating this content. If you wanted to do any kind of text projection, if you wanted to do um, any kind of uh, uh, effects or transitions um, or conversion from, say, equirectangular to uh, spherical or, 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 or cube style, various flavors of, of, of 360 VR, um, that's where you had to go. So what you will see in the next version of both Premiere Pro and After Effects is that we now have many of those Skybox plugins deeply integrated and rebranded inside the applications as well. And you'll find them under the category Immersive. So everything from smooth transitions, titles, graphics and effects, um, and with all of this comes the ability now to navigate your VR timeline into head mount display while still incorporating and allowing you to do keyboard driven editing with things like scrub and markers. And I'm going to show you a quick video of that in just a second here. But let's first start uh, and let's talk about text because this is the first thing that people always ask is how do I do, how do I add text to my 360 video? And again, you could do it today in Premiere by itself, but we didn't, we didn't know how to project that 2D text in a 360 environment. So it wound up just not being correct. It didn't look right. So here's what we're going to do. We're actually going to go ahead and start by adding a text layer. Now, I actually made a little master graphic, which is basically the beginnings of a text template, and I called it Venice in the Summertime. Okay, So here we've got some text sitting in this uh, in, in the equirectangular frame here with the VR viewer turned off. Now, if I go ahead and turn on the VR video display, here's where you know right away that it's just not doing what it's supposed to. And by the way, let me go ahead and turn those uh, safe margins off because it shouldn't, it shouldn't be bending like that. You know, if I'm in a headset, it shouldn't have this weird smile thing going on. That's because it's not being projected probably. That's because it was never intended to do that. Well, now with the new metal effects that we have, you can. So let me go ahead and just drop the effects panel up here. Type in immersive. And what we're looking for here is VR plane to sphere. So I'm going to take this effect, drag it onto our text template, and go into effects controls. And now you can see, again, if we just go back out for a second, okay, that's what it looks like now. And inside the VR viewer, it's no longer bent. Now, the first thing I want to do is scale it up. So let's go ahead and make this around 120. Okay, now you can see that quite nicely. And now, as we move around the frame, okay, it's actually doing what it should. It's positioning it as it should. And you can see that you've got quite a few different options here. So let me see. There was another scene I wanted to cut to here. Ah, this one. All right, so let's say that we actually wanted to take this text... And instead of having it in the center, I actually want to have it so that it's oriented against the wall here. Okay. So for this, we're going to go back over to our effects controls, and I'm going to twirl down. You notice you've got rotate source and rotate uh, projection. So I'm going to click and drag on our y-axis here and orient this against the wall like so, and. I'm just going to scrub here because my laptop is loving all this. But now you can see, and here, let's just give it a shot. I'm trying to play this back in quarter res. There we go. And now you can see that that text is quite nicely oriented against that wall properly, doing exactly what it should. Plain to sphere. Simple. So now you can do uh, projected text 
properly in 360 with this effect. Again, directly integrated into Premiere Pro and After Effects. Okay, now this next one, what about changing the start position? So this is again something, I think this is probably the first thing that we heard from people as well. This is how the video was shot, but I don't want to start at the front of the boat. I, I, want, to, I want to start here, 90 degrees over. How do I change the start position? Well, my answer would have been go to metal. <laughs> But now you can do it, it's integrated directly. So you can actually change the viewer start position, okay, using an, an effect called rotate sphere. So if we go back to effects, again, under immersive video, you can see VR rotate sphere. Let's go ahead and drag this down over top of our clip here under effects controls. And once again, we're gonna use our Y axis here and simply by Modifying this, now we can change the start position. Whatever is center is your zero start position. Done. That's it. Now, of course, they can still move around as it's playing. None of that changes, but that first, that starting point is now this. Okay? And this is a good idea sometimes, just so you can see, if I unhide the controls. So there, there's our starting point now, zero, zero, right? That's it. Okay. Really super cool. Again, this is now all will be directly integrated into Premiere Pro, into After Effects. Super cool, super efficient. All right, so let's go ahead and take that off. We don't need to uh, change that just now. Let's talk a little bit about um, transitions. So transitions are really, you know, we're so used to seeing them, we're so used to using them um, in you know traditional sort of equi equilinear content, um, standard 2D edits and things. But really what VR transitions are about is really kind of creating that narrative, kind of adding to the effect of the story that you're trying to tell here. And you start to see a lot of really common ones, again, largely because they've come from metal in the first place. Well, you're going to find a whole series of them in, of them in here as well under Video Transitions Immersive. So just to kind of give you an idea, and these actually play through really nicely, let's go, uh, let's start with something like our VR light rays. I'm just going to go ahead and drag this over top of our clips here. And again, if we just go into the flat view first, this kind of shows you what that transition looks like. The nice thing about the VR transitions, now that they're proper VR transitions, how you apply them, how you adjust them, how you modify them is exactly how you would have used traditional ones anyway, except that now in your headset, in your viewer, oh, oh, hold on, wait for it. All right, hold on, my machine's catching up. There we go. All right, hold on, let me kick the viewer back in. Going too fast. Okay. There we go. All right. We're kind of seeing what that light ray looks like again inside the VR viewer. Let's try a different one. How about iris wipe? Now this is the iris, you know, in traditional video, we don't, uh, we don't even joke about that. You know, that's like, I don't know about that. But for VR, it's a whole different experience, and it, it kind of works. And you start to, see, you've seen a lot of this. If you watch a lot of VR on YouTube, you've seen this transition being used. Once again, if we go into our VR viewer, there's just something, I don't know, very aesthetically pleasing about that, and it just kind of works. Okay. Similarly, something that I use and have done a couple live streams on. Um, light leaks, starting to see over the last couple of years, a lot of sort of, you know, overlays and things, probably largely created in After Effects, some actually done, you know, traditionally and then converted into video. VR light leaks, so once again, simple, easy transitions, using these as a narrative device to improve that story. Super, super cool. Now there's many, many others to choose from. I don't have time to show you all of them. God, 642. Um, while we're here, of course, when we're talking about VR and immersive, we also need to talk about ambisonic audio. You wouldn't have this immersive experience without audio. Ambisonic audio was added in the, uh, in the June release, or NAB release rather, April release. Um, I've got an AmbiX file down here inside of my sequence. You'll notice if you go into the new sequence uh, dialog, that we have a whole series of VR presets, both in mono and stereoscopic, um, that also give you support for ambisonic audio. Now this is a key thing that you want to point out, that I want to point out here. 
Within Premiere Pro's audio preps, you have to ensure that multi-channel mono media, default audio track option is set to adaptive for this to work. Where do you find that? You find it again under Preferences, Audio. Default audio tracks, multi-channel mono media, adaptive. Once that's done, and once you set up your sequence to have four channels of output, you're good to go. You can now upload this to Facebook, to YouTube. It will respect that ambisonic audio. Super cool, very efficient, very effective. You also have some options here inside the track mixer. If you're trying to audition this, ambisonics for, uh, with headphones, we have something here if we go into special called the binauralizer. I don't know what that is. So we can go into binauralizer here. And again, what you're actually going to see is a, is a two-channel playout of the audio there. Um, this is going to, again, in headphones, simulate that spatial audio sound that you would have once it's published. You've also got, um, if we go ahead and come down here, you've also got a panner. So just in the way that we modified the start position of the video, you can actually use the ambisonic panner to do the same thing for your audio. So naturally, if it was captured looking this way with your microphone pointing this way and you reorient the video, now your audio doesn't work. So you can use that panner to effectively do the same thing, to change that start position um, of your audio really easily, really effectively. And this can also be keyframed as well. So that's ambisonics. Okay. All right. The last thing I'm going to show you in, in Premiere before we move over to After Effects and then Character Animator and then Adobe Audition. Okay. I'm probably going to go about 10 minutes over. I'm just warning you right now. Um, deals with Adobe Stock and specifically some of those uh, motion graphics templates that we were talking about before. So in fact, here, you know what? I'm just going to uh, close, let me close this and I'll open up a, a different project. So motion graphics templates, what's the big announce here? Well, first of all, what's new is that very soon you may have seen we had a blog article on this that we will be bringing motion graphics templates to Adobe Stock, pre-built templates from incredible designers, hundreds, thousands, millions. Actually, don't no, that's not true. I have no idea how many just yet. We haven't announced that just yet. There will be many of them. More importantly, there will be pay versions and there will be many free versions. I'm going to show you that here in just a moment. All right, so let's just go over to our graphics, uh, our graphics panel again here. And if we go into our libraries panel, where's my libraries? Oh, here, I'm gonna dock this over here real quickly. All right, so what you'll be able to do in your libraries panel in Premiere Pro is you'll be able to type in um, uh, one of several different categories. This include titles, overlays, lower thirds, transitions, transitions backgrounds, uh, infographics, social media, and these are very customizable as well. So let's start with something like titles. You'll see that we now have, again, through our filtered search, we can search for templates, and it actually shows you which ones are free and which ones are paid. Again, these were created by top designers, um, and we talk about customization because if they were created in After Effects, now some of these, like you can see this clean one line, this was probably built in Premiere Pro. It's real simple, it's real easy. It's not so much to customize there. But there's other ones, where's that one that I like so much, like this update or ink blotch. These were both created uh, in After Effects. So these have some pretty intense animation going on over top of them. So what I'm gonna do here, let me just go ahead and scrub over here. I'm just going to mute the sound. And let's go over to my essential graphics. Actually, go into my libraries because I actually have some of these already saved. Here's Ink Blotch. Let's go ahead and drag this down into the timeline. All right. So let it go ahead and load in now. One of the other things you'll notice, even between April's release and now, is that these are faster, more efficient, leaner. I say that as it's still trying to load the media, of course. <laughs> and infinitely customizable based on whatever the designer wanted to let you customize. Now, if we go ahead and select this one, go into Essential Graphics, this is now showing you all of the various attributes that you can modify. And what's happening here is, again, we are actually now accessing all the same cached frames. We've actually got mini After Effects kind of technology running under the hood. Something that's also new in this next version is that you will no longer need 
After Effects installed to let these run. So again, it's going a little bit slowly here just because we've been doing a lot of things. I'm going to see if this will catch up. I'm going to go ahead and change and modify the text. I'll call this Jason Levine, live at IBC. All right. And you can see that it instantly updates there. And then you can adjust text scale and position and reveal speed, you know, how it sort of emerges onto the screen there. And then for the ink blotch, you can see you've got these different comments here. Ink blotch opacity and X and Y position, ink blotch two, and the speed of that. And then you've got camera and light, spotlight width, camera shape, light flicker frequency, all of these things the designer gave you to modify, to be able to modify them. Oh, this, this isn't full quality, that's fine. Okay, let me go down to like a quarter res here. Um, all right, very, very simply, very, very easily. So these are coming to Adobe stock, and more importantly, shortly thereafter, you too will be able to become a, an Adobe stock contributor of MoGrids, of motion graphics templates. I can't tell you after NAB how many people came up and said, number one, we want to be able to buy these on Adobe stock. So we heard you. You're going to be able to buy them. You're going to be able to license free ones. This one is free right here. Also, we'd like to be able to sell our own because we're designers and we make really cool stuff. And that's coming later, but you will be able to do that too. So this is such an incredible, incredible thing. I mean, I'm the first person to say, I, I can't make, I could never make this look good. I mean, I could make that, it would never look like that. I have so much design anxiety and font anxiety and, and vignette anxiety. I could never make this. It would just take me forever and it would never look this good. Now I don't have to. Designers have already done it and I can pick and choose and download and license and do, and I still have all this editability here which is super, super cool. So we're really, really happy to be able to bring that uh, directly to you, okay? All right, oh, and you know what? Before I close out of Premiere, I told you I was just gonna show you, just regarding the head mount display. Now, I don't have it set up here. I just wanted to kind of show you a really quick video about this um, that just kind of, again, just sort of details the process here. You can see my colleague, Michael. Let me go ahead and turn off my camera just real briefly here. So here he is, he's wearing, uh, wearing his headset. He's got, I think it's the Oculus Rift. And I don't know what that controller is. Yeah, I can't remember which, which combo this is. But you can see that he's actually, we've actually got a projection of the sequence timeline in the viewer, all right? So what he's actually seeing, when he's moving his head around, you can see right there, he's using this little laser pointer inside the headset to change things, to change the edit, to scrub. Again, and because he's only using one hand with the controller, he can still make modifications with keyboard shortcuts. You can see there that as he's adjusting, the views there are reflecting what's happening. Really, really cool, all right? So this is, again, just something that um, in this next release is gonna give you even more immersive capabilities as you dive into uh, working in this VR domain. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna transition over to After Effects. So I'm just gonna close up my screen here. How's everyone doing in the chat? All right, Tony's got vignette anxiety. Good, I'm, I'm glad I'm not alone. <laughs> Maybe we should start a, start a group, man. Okay, so similarly with Premiere, gonna talk about a couple of quick things. Uh, first, that are really cool, again, sort of user requests, and then we'll talk about two of the big things uh, in After Effects as well. Okay, so I think this is what I want. Let's go ahead and switch back over. And there we go. All right. So, oh, and actually here, first of all, let me just close this. <laughs> so, making it easier to get started in After Effects. We heard from so many, we've heard from so many users over the years. They open up After Effects, and this, you know, previously this, this stuff wasn't here. Pretend like that's not there. And they say, all right, how do I start? And they go, like, sort of file, import, and there's all these options. And what if I have multiple files? Or I don't, I don't even know. How do I just make a composition? I know I need a comp, I just don't know how to begin. So now, right inside the comp panel, you've got new comp. If you click on that, it automatically takes you to the comp settings dialog and new comp from footage. So we go ahead and take this. I could choose, again, one of my 360 videos, all right? Boom. It automatically creates the comp. It automatically does what it's supposed to, and you're good to go, all right? So really simple, easy stuff. Now, with regard to keyboard shortcuts, I don't know an, uh, an After Effects user worth their salt who isn't like a, a, you know, an After Effects keyboard shortcut whiz. Um, 
I learned a few from uh, the goddess of After Effects, Miss Angie Taylor, whom I heard from today, actually. Really cool. Um, now we have a visual keyboard shortcut editor here. Again, this was something that we introduced into Premiere a couple of versions ago. We brought it into Audition. Surprisingly, we didn't have it in After Effects. So now you will have it in After Effects, of course, the purple. If you guys are new to what this view is showing you here, it's kind of global shortcuts for the entire app. The green means if you're inside a panel, it'll have certain functionality specific to that panel. Fully searchable, editable, really simple, really easy, something that you guys have been asking for for a very long time. Um, really glad to have that. Having said that too, making animations, shareable animations, specifically I'm talking about GIFs and the ability to export animated GIF. Now we've had this on Windows. Um, we haven't had it on the Mac side for a long time and I'll be the first to say I've had to make some GIFs over the last year or two as they've continued to grow in popularity and just be there and constantly seeing them. Well, it's now been brought back um, to Adobe Media Encoder. So if I zoom in down here, you can see that you now have an animated GIF capability. That's it. Nothing fancy there. We just brought that back. We heard you. It was a drag that it wasn't in there before. Um, now it's back. And again, you can do that directly from Media Encoder. Also, with regard to GPU acceleration, uh, now again, in the last release, we had a bunch of GPU accelerated effects. This next release of After Effects continues on that trend as well. So um, directional blur is one of the main effects that's GPU accelerated, as well as motion blur and layer transforms. Yes. So really what you're starting to see is After Effects becoming more and more real time, more and more uh, just responsive, not responsive design, but responsive to how you're working, how you're creating, again, saving you time. You're not even saving it. It's just you're not wasting any time, right? So more and more GPU uh, accelerated capabilities. Also, it's worth pointing out that um, any third-party plugins that use Premiere Pro's Mercury SDK, um, they're accelerated too, which is great. And of course, the rebranded immersive effects in here are accelerated as well. So even if you noticed, again, if you've tried some of those in Premiere previously, they, they weren't quite as robust. They're going to be faster and just perform better. Okay, so really the main thing that I'm going to show you here is something that we call data-driven data -driven animations or data-driven design or data-driven motion graphics comps. And really what this is, it's the ability to create a comp using a data file and that data will automatically populate, the, it automatically create the animation for you using a JSON file and expressions. And something like this comp here is something that would have taken forever to do by hand. Now you can simply import that JSON file and I'm talking about something, say, uh, a data list that you got from a CSV file and there's many CSV to JSON converters out there. You bring in the JSON file as an asset and you reference their values as expressions, really, really simply. So what we have here is a list of the greater 48 states in the US, and it's basically an animation that shows in, in a particular state what they refer to soft drinks as, whether it's pop or pap, depending upon where you are in that part of the country, um, soda or soda, um, and other, and we'll get to other in a second. And what you'll notice down here is that we have this expression control capability. So you can change the pop color, soda color, the other color. And then we have this state ID slider. Let's go ahead and change this to number one, which happens to be Alabama. And you can see that in Alabama, it uses a word that rhymes with jokes. So the primary term for soda or pop is the other, which happens to rhyme with joke, Coke. So we call it Coke. Not uncommon in parts of the US, whether it's Sprite or whatever, it's, you know, give me a Coke. Um, and that number, that numerical value, the state ID, if we look down here inside the comp, you can actually see that that's kind of an integral part of how this expression is working. And if I go ahead and just zoom in here, you can actually see the expression. And again, all of this is pointing to this JSON data file. So what does that mean? Because all of, and if, let me go ahead and just play this back for you so you can kind of see what the animation looks like, all right? So it's just kind of filling in the space. And again, all of these, it's just pulling from this data set. So because of that, what that means is, if I go over to our project panel here, let's twirl this down, let's go into our JSON samples, and here's our other soda pop JSON file. I'm gonna go ahead and reveal this in the finder. And let's go ahead and open this with text edit, okay? 
And right at the top here, you can see the state ID, number one, Alabama. So the winner is other. Let's go ahead and change these values. We'll make pop 79% and other 4%. Let's go ahead and save this, bounce back to After Effects, and it just automatically changes. Did you see that? Right, now Alabama is red, pop is the winner. And notice all of these other elements change too. The check mark color, folk prefer pop for fizzy beverages, all right? That's 79.2%. So think of the possibilities with this, okay? Really super cool. Here's another example where we've got some weather conditions, all right? So right now this is showing, uh, I think this is Seattle, okay? So this is kind of what it looks like. You can see there's some rain animation going on here. And it's kind of showing you over a period of time the temperature's going up and it's or down. And it's kind of giving you the time of day as this is caching and doing its thing. Okay, well this too is controlled via a JSON file. So what I'd like to do is I'm actually going to swap this out with a different one. So let's go ahead and do it. I think we've got it for uh, Shanghai. All right. Um, where is it? Here. There we go. Shanghai weather. Oh, whoops. Sorry. It's this one over here. My bad. Seattle. Let's replace. Shanghai. Open. Ooh, there we go. All right. And all the data instantly changes. Again, and I can just kind of scrub through this. You get the idea. Data-driven animation. Again, imagine having to do this manually, right? Now you take that JSON file, import it as an asset, boom. The animation happens automatically. The keyframing, it's doing all of this. We didn't keyframe this, it's doing it. Now here's another really cool one that I think kind of showcases this really well. And this also leverages a little bit of C4D. And this is showing um, median home prices uh, from 1996 to 2016. So a couple years before the housing boom, and then, you know, uh, seven, eight years after or so. And again, what, if we take a look here at the expression controls, you can see that you can modify, you know, hot, cold, the side color, extrusion depth. So again, this is because this is using the Cinema 4D engine here. Um, let me just go ahead and scrub this through. You can see how the states are growing, and by the way, you notice the timeline down here. So right now we're in around 2004, 2005. Look at California, look at Arizona, look at Texas. They're peaking up, and now as we go past 2007, it crashes down, okay? All of this animation being driven entirely by a data file, by a JSON file, all right? And it's using Cinema 4D's engine to do that extrusion there. Similarly, here's another one where we're actually using, it's the same exact thing, um, this time using the classic uh, 3D renderer. So you don't have the extrusion on this, but you still kind of get a pretty good idea. I like this one actually. In fact, let's change let's change this these colors. Bring this a little bit more, something like that. All right. There we go. Yeah, that looks a little bit better, okay? So really, really cool, simple to use, and it goes without saying, an amazing time saver here. All right, and you'll be able to see more about this and more details about how this works um, beginning, I think, tomorrow or Saturday with Carl Soleil live from IBC, streamed uh, on one of our Facebook properties. We'll actually kind of take you through the whole process of authoring and working with these things, okay? All right, so real quickly, because we got to transition over to um, uh, to Character Animator and Audition. Probably going to go about 12 minutes over here. Um, I just wanted to show you once again, um, using our little new comp example here, uh, just a couple of things with regard to VR capabilities here in After Effects. So I mentioned all the effects and things. Um, something else that you'll, that you'll see if you go into the comp menu here is that you've got a couple of, quite a few different options. First of all, we've got something called the VR Comp Editor. So we want to turn this into something that we can edit and modify and work with, just as we were doing so before in Premiere Pro. I'm going to go ahead and add my 2D edit here. The comp width happens to be 
5600 pixels, 16.9, center camera, add 2D edit. Okay, and now if I go ahead and uh, grab my orbit camera tool, um, just, just as we saw in Premiere, now you can you know, freely move around and be inside the sphere directly in After Effects. And by the way, this is in full quality at you know, 5.5K. So this is crazy running on my little laptop here. Now you saw a moment ago what we've also got in here. Um, and by the way, that VR comp editor, the, the, the key here is that it's working directly with your immersive content. It'll transform that equi rectangular 360 footage into that flat image that allows you to, again, move the frame around, view different parts of the scene. Um, you've got under composition VR, create VR environment. This is going to allow you to design motion graphics experiences with or without live action footage. You've also got extract cube map. Um, what's pretty significant about this is that this is going to allow you to do um, basically the simplified process of motion tracking and uh, object removal. And what's really cool about this is, and I believe they're probably still up there on uh, their Vimeo channel, Metal's got some really, really um, great training tutorials um, uh, for, uh, for working, working with this content and how to do this. So uh, again, lots of capabilities there. My machine is really, really slow to update right now. But all the same VR capabilities, and even some that you don't have in Premiere, you're going to find in After Effects. Incredibly efficient, incredibly fast, incredibly robust. OK, so now let's transition over to Character Animator. All right, we're only five minutes over. We're still doing OK. Let's go ahead and launch this. Put this on so you don't see our splash there. Almost got away from me. OK, and here we go. OK, so uh, first of all, oh, I'm going to have to take off my glasses. Right, I'm going to be a little blind. So bear with me, but we have to do this for our art. And in fact, I'm going to turn off the bottom camera because that's just distracting since I'm already there. Okay, so let me go ahead and set my rest pose. Okay, so um, one of the things that we really wanted to do, we wanted more options. What we heard from people is more options to make the face specifically more expressive, right? More live, more expressive. And Part of that begins with eyebrows, and I, we've been able to track eyebrows for some time, but you know, our eyebrows actually move and bend and do a lot of things. So if we go under the face section here in our track item behaviors, you're going to notice towards the bottom now that we have raised eyebrow tilt and lowered eyebrow tilt. And if I put my eyebrows up, watch what happens as I drag this. So when I stop doing that, Mm -hmm. Now, if I really want a furrowed brow, I, I definitely have that kind of furrowed, slightly angry brow, <laughs> brow, but it needs to be more furrowed and angry. So, that's, that's maybe too much. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, uh. All right. This is the problem with character animators. You start messing around and it's just, it's just too fun. So eyebrow control, look at already more expressive, more real. Now, one of the things that you may have noticed though, and we heard this from a lot of people, is that characters tend to have that kind of floating eye effect, right? Where it's just, they're kind of, they're kind of wiggling around all over the place. And in more sort of traditional animation, the eyes tend to dart sort of left to right, up or down. And there's, there's, there's a bit of a, um, there's there's a bit more of a of a of a of a almost delay when that happens. So oh, and I actually had it already turned on. Shoot. Okay, there's the googly eyes. Sorry, I, I thought that looked a little smooth. So this is kind of what they looked like before, where they're just always kind of the pupils are always kind of moving and sort of googly, and we know that that wasn't really ideal. So now you've got a default option to snap eye gaze with a minimum snap duration. So if we made this, let's just say we made it two seconds. That's three seconds. And let's say that I look over to the side, or down. Yeah, that's a little too long, right? <laughs> let's set it back to one second. All right, I'll go over here. See that? It already looks better. It already looks just more realistic. It looks like how it should. 
and infinitely more expressive. This is already since April, all right? They listened, they heard, and then, by the way, oh, and of course, this is the official 1.0 of Character Animator. It is no longer beta anymore. So congrats to the team. This is awesome. Super, super cool. Now, another area that they wanted to improve upon was the ability to um, uh, allow you to modify the speech and, again, how it sort of translates your spoken word into uh, the proper visims. And you've got 14 different mouth shapes on this character here. And of course, powered by Adobe Sensei is how we're actually analyzing what you say and translating those mouth shapes. So let's go ahead and just do a really quick recording here, and I'm going to show you what's also new. All right, here we go. Hi, and thanks for watching our live stream today. Now you're going to get to see some of the really cool additions inside the timeline. All right, go ahead and stop that. And what you now see, first of all, boom. Audio waveforms, yes, audio waveforms. And you've got the Vizim track just below those. So as you're scrubbing through, first of all, this saves an enormous amount of time because you can see where the beginning and ends of words are. If you right click on a particular mouth shape here, you can automatically swap it out, okay? You can trim, you can realign, you can swap mouth shapes, um, it's just really simple, really easy, and again, it's one step closer to getting that character looking super perfect. Okay, really, really cool, and uh, we're really, really excited about that. Okay, uh, all right, 7, 10, oh man, I gotta fly. Okay, I'm gonna have to cut a couple things. So we've got some pose-to-pose -pose stuff. Again, this comes sort of out of a mimicking a more traditional style where, again, you're kind of, it's pose-to-pose, -pose, so there's actually a bit of a delay. People have talked about, oh, I like that, how that's looking. Um, people have kind of just talked about how, again, these things are a little, they're a little too one-to-one -one real time. It's very cool, but that isn't really how animated characters should necessarily look. That's kind of where you cross that line and it stops being, uh, stops being as, you know, uh, as, as realistic and awesome looking. So now we've got that, and you can actually find that once again here, pose to pose movement, minimum pose duration, and smoothing. So if we go ahead and, ah, heck, I'll just I'll go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and make this 75%. And smoothing is kind of your ease. So if I move my head over here, right, <laughs> kind of feels more Simpsons-y now somehow. There's something about it that I really, really like. So that's a pose-to-pose -pose option. Um, all right, now for this one here, this is really super cool. Uh, triggers. So you'll know that we had all these capabilities, have all these capabilities where you can, you know, set certain triggers on screen. So uh, here, I'll turn this back on for just a moment. So while you're animating, you know, you, and you've probably seen this when they did the Simpsons thing last year, they actually had on their keyboard little post-it notes of, okay, shortcut key one has Homer raise his arm. Shortcut key two has him wipe his brow. Shortcut key three has him, you know, peace sign or whatever it is. Um, and these things can get pretty complex. They were a little bit difficult to set up. And basically, though, there was no way to very easily recall them. It was all kind of contained in the properties and, and puppet panel here. And we wanted to, to make it easier to access those different triggers and also just to add new triggers. So, for instance, here I have glasses for our character Chloe here. And what you'll note now is that down below, and here I'll turn off my camera again so I'm not in the way, we've got a nice little triggers panel that shows you all the keyboard shortcuts that are assigned. So if I wanted to take these glasses and make them a trigger, I can just drag it down here. I can click inside and I can say, okay, we're going to make glasses the letter G, assuming that's not used by anything else, and now that's the keyboard shortcut for that. Here's where it gets really, really cool. You can even use MIDI notes to trigger things. Yeah, that's right. So if you've got a MIDI controller connected with your audio device, I mean, this is really neat. Uh, you actually have the ability to, um, to trigger these things via a keyboard or, again, MIDI device using MIDI note data. So you don't even have to use the keyboard. You're really freeing up, uh, freeing up a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, resources there very, very easily. Okay. Now, taking that a step further, um, control panel. So this is a visual way to do this, uh, particularly if you're doing something like live streaming. And this is really something that uh, uh, we saw 
um, again on The Simpsons. So here we have this uh, Steve Bot character. Here we are in our control panel, and we're going to go ahead and choose Generate Controls. And what this does is it scrubs through your entire puppet and it looks for triggers, okay? It automatically adds buttons. So you can see here like this one, if I hit number one or click on this, he's got a little sound wave coming out of his left arm there. And if I click over here, it's his light or, you know, camera action, all right? And of course, I could probably be picking this up or doing some other things, assuming that's built in there. Um, you've also got number three here, so he can blink his glasses, add some additional lights there. All right. Now what's cool is that you'll notice here under layout that you can move these things around. But what they've also done now, and you'll see this in terms of some of the options here in physics and some of the options in transform, is you can actually drag parameters like opacity or maybe scale X. Now the reason you'd be doing this is again, notice we're in stream mode up here. So this was something that we added in the April release as well. Let's go back into perform. So let's say, you know, Steve Bot is doing something, and then while we're live streaming, you've been seeing this a lot on Twitch and things, he's just going to start disappearing. So you've got, opa you know, got our opacity control. Or, you know, we can scale the X here. No, notice he's got the dangle, the cable dangle. Okay. Really cool stuff. Um, they've just thought of so many things here. Oh, there's just not enough time to show everything. Okay. But we got to get to some of this. All right. So here we are back with our, with our dude, I don't know what this guy's name is, and uh, you'll notice that as he turns his head, notice that like the hair and the shadows on his face are also kind of moving and conforming. All right, well, how are we doing that? Well, we're doing that by using a clipping mask. So now we actually have support for clipping masks. So here, let's go back into this one. Let's find our guy. All right. And... If we go up to the Puppet menu, let's go ahead and release the clipping mask. So you notice we've got the circular mask on the head. Well, if we release the clipping mask, now you can actually see the hair up at the top here, and again, the different shadows that have been created. Let's go ahead and turn this back on, create the clipping mask. Very, very simply. This was something that people have been asking for. Now you've got it. Now I'm going to take this even a step further because uh, and again, let's go ahead and generate controls for Stan. This actually deals with um, one of the other fader behaviors that we've added, um, where we now can actually have, again, a behavior that will trigger to make his face red. So if I go ahead and hit shortcut key one, mm -hmm. very embarrassed, let go, can fade out again. All right, so really cool, really, really simple, really easy. Um, you saw before how we can drag things in, don't need to go over that. Last thing I'm going to show you here, physics. Okay, we now have, again, now we've had physics capabilities before. You see this in Dangle. You're also going to notice that things like Dangle and, and our gravity strength have all been moved under this new uh, uh, physics section here. And what this actually allows you to do is you can tag objects as dynamic objects that can effectively collide into one another and have all the same sorts of physical uh, 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 properties. Again, they can collide with other objects. Let's go ahead and go into the um, actual rig here. And I'll select one of these guys and you can see that down in the tag panel, this is so easy to do. I mean, you don't have to know anything, you have to code anything. You want this to respect physics, so here you have options to collide. And we want it to be dynamic. Again, this is, it's able to move and be pushed around also draggable, okay, it even tells you here, all right, modifier, draggable, okay, for this guy. Now here our little ghost, he's dynamic, which means that it, you, it's able to move and be pushed around, and it's draggable, but it, it's not gonna, it doesn't collide, okay, all right, so it doesn't collide with other objects, and you get the idea. So if we just go back to physics here real quickly, again, just to kind of show you the fluidity of all this, this just makes me laugh, and you can just see the weight and how beautiful this is. Again, grab my ghost. Oops, just dread, flew him off screen. <laughs> got all these other things. There's the chicken. And as you might expect, got to have an exploding chicken if it came from Dave Werner here. So shortcut key one, boom, chicken explodes. Okay. All right. So modified physics engine, fader behaviors, clipping masks, uh, waveforms with your Vizim editor, so many more things, uh, uh, eye darts and eye gaze. I mean, Character Animator is an official 1.0.
this is really something else. What an incredible, incredible amount of innovation in this, in this product. You got to try this out. Again, bringing your 2D and 3D characters to life directly from Photoshop. It doesn't get any cooler than that. All right. And lastly, let's get out of here and let's go ahead and launch Audition. I can do this in five minutes. I know I can. All right, let's go back to our desktop here. There was just no way I was going to get through all these features in, in 60 minutes. Too much stuff to show. Okay, so we're going to start with a little powered by Adobe Sensei technology featuring the Essential Sound Panel. Now you're going to hear a little bit of this. I don't know how well it's going to come over. But here we have a scene from a film called See You Around, directed by Oren Brimmer. We showed a lot of this at, um, at NAB. And in this particular scene, we've got a lot of dialogue and music and sound effects. And if you just take a quick listen to this first, you're going to hear that, you know, obviously the dialogue itself has been kind of normalized and fixed, but the music is still a little bit too loud. Take a quick listen. Hi. Uh, uh, okay. Great. Okay. Now I realize that's coming through my mic here, so you're, you're not going to hear that very well. What we need to do is we need to duck the music underneath the dialogue. Now you'll notice here in the Essential Sound Panel, if I go ahead and just click on Dialogue, it's going to show you all of the clips that have already been denoted as dialogue. But down below here we have music, and nothing's been done with this yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose music, and when I go into the music type, you're now going to see a new field, a new parameter for ducking. Let's go ahead and enable ducking and when you turn this on, much like when you use the Adobe Remix function, it's going to analyze the audio, it's going to analyze the music and then it simply asks you what do you want to duck the music against? Dialogue, other music, other sound effects, other ambience, or duck it against clips that don't even have an audio type. And I realize you can't see me. Duck it against clips that don't even have an audio type. That's super cool in and of itself. And if we zoom back out, what you'll now see inside, non-destructively on the waveform here, is you can actually see how, powered by Adobe Sensei, it is using machine learning to understand the amplification of the dialogue and duck it accordingly. Now you've got your sensitivity slider here, so I'm just looking at this, I think it's probably, it needs to be needs to have a lower sensitivity so it's catching a bit more and you can see that it modifies and changes visually the ducking right on screen. You can also adjust the amount of reduction. So let's make this pretty extreme just so that you can kind of hear it over the stream here coming through my mic. And then you can also control the fade, right? So when it ducks, do you want it to be sharp or do you want it to kind of bezier ramp in? And that is just a matter of finding that sweet spot. This might be a little bit long Let's kind of shorten this a little bit. Maybe just split the difference, something like that. Let's go ahead and wind back and take a listen. Here we go. Hi, yeah, hi. Uh, I'd like to be uh, okay. Great. I'd like an elderberry. All right. So cool, right? Again, we could make it even more extreme. I'm gonna drop it, you know. I mean, you wouldn't do it that much. But. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, uh, okay. Powered by Adobe Sensei. So cool. So awesome. Automatic ducking. Not to be confused with automatic duck. Automatic ducking. Now you can still do traditional sidechain ducking in Audition as well. But this just makes it so easy. And it doesn't even have to be audio files that are tagged. You don't even have to do anything else in Essential Sound. If this is all you do, it's just going to work brilliantly. Okay? All right. Now you'll notice with video that we've got some new options there too. Specifically now, we have a timecode display. And if we go into our video preference options, you will see that first and foremost, you can change the position of your timecode. You can adjust the size. First, you want to enable it all together. Um, you can change the background opacity. All right. Very simply, very easily. And the time reference can be the session time. Or if your media has embedded timecode, it can take that timecode as well, and that's what it'll display on screen. This applies directly when we're talking about um, some of our new multi-track recording preferences, um, in particular when you're doing things like smart monitoring. Now I can't show you this here for recording, 
Smart monitoring is basically we have a whole new system inside of Audition that effectively allows you to punch in very effectively. And while you're listening back to the take, it'll go, smart monitoring will only, you'll only hear yourself when you're punched in at the spot that you want to be in. So you're hearing all the reference audio, reference audio, reference audio, punch in. Now you hear yourself smartly punch back out and it's back to the regular audio. Again, watching time code, paying attention, being able to kind of play these things back and loop around them very, very easily. So smart monitoring is something really, really cool that we've added here as well. You've also got the ability now when you stack clips over top of one another, it used to be that things would get lost. Uh, they'd fall behind each other. That doesn't happen anymore. All right. So it was very easy to forget that something was living behind something else because, uh, and again, this would be if it was specifically like cut, uh, uh, um, and you'd move it and you go, oh, there's, there's, there's something there. I didn't even see it. That doesn't happen anymore, which is really awesome. Additionally, with regard to fades, you now have some very cool options inside of Audition. So here we've got some crossfades, and you'll notice when I zoom in here, we've got some key, some tips. So if you hold down the Alt key, it'll apply symmetric fade. Hold down Command to change the fade shape. Hold down Shift to either fade duration or shape. So let's let's first hold down Alt. Oops. Okay. All right. Okay. So notice it's going from linear to cosine, linear to cosine. Okay. This is something that you would have had to have right-clicked before to add splines. Now command is doing that in and of itself. Now, what if you like you like the um, the duration, but you want to change the fade a bit? So if we hold down Shift and we drag up or down. This changes the fade value, but it doesn't change the duration of the fade, okay? Additionally, what if we like the fade type, but we want to change the duration? Hold down shift, drag left or right. Now the fade shape doesn't change, but you're adjusting the duration. So a lot of keyboard modifiers to make that happen here. Also, you've got unbelievably faster mix down. And we're actually quoting it. I don't even like saying this, but I have to tell you it is pretty Pretty freaking true. Um, definitely 2x to 4x faster mixing down than you've seen before. The mixing engine in here, it was already fast. It is so fast and faster than real time. Um, it's just something else, particularly if you're using all native effects. Really an incredible speed enhancement with mixing down. Um, you've also got additional options for channel labeling. So this was something that we kind of introduced before in the April release where you could sort of see the channels and move them around. Well now, right inside the editor here, if I right click on a channel label, you can actually change the labels of channels in stereo or multi-channel and channel files right here and it writes those changes to the metadata. So let's say if I, you know, again, now this is depending upon the file type, this is actually telling you Depending upon the audio file format, label information might not be stored via metadata or only in a restricted way. So not all file types support this, but this is something particularly in broadcast, again, or sometimes sometimes things are just labeled incorrectly. The recorder that did them, actually, things are out of whack. There, there, it was an uncommon long ago, particularly with 5.1 files, right? If they weren't using the Dolby standard, uh, front left, front right, um, left surround, right surround, center sub, that's not correct. It should be front left, front right, center sub, left surround, right surround. People go and play this back in their system and things, you, the center and, and LFE was playing out of the rear speakers. That isn't what it's supposed to be. So this would be a very easy way to correct and fix and change that. That info gets stored in the metadata. It's non-destructive, really simple, really cool, really easy. We've also reintroduced, and I just want to show this to you real quickly, an effect that many of you old school Premiere users loved, the classic dynamics effect. Now, why this is cool, let me go ahead and just, let me see if I can pull up some dialogue where it matters. Uh, yeah, well, that's close enough, it's fine. Um, why this is really cool, and I don't know if Mike is still on the, on, on the, the chat here, um, is for this one thing right here, the auto gate. Yeah, no, we don't have it. Okay, I'll take a shot of fireball. Perfect. Okay. Auto-gating, compression, downward expansion, 
or expansion, limiting, redesigned, reskinned. You've got your classic Dynamics effect back in both Premiere Pro and Audition. To be honest, um, the compressor and limiter, they're okay. I, musically, I, I'm not a huge fan. What I am a huge fan of is the auto gate because we didn't have an auto gate. So this is fantastic. It works brilliantly. It's brilliant for dial. Again, you've got that noisy dialogue. You can fix some of the noise destructively or non-destructively or just fix some of the noise non-destructively and then apply the auto gate to, again, attenuate any of the trailing, tailing off noise that you just uh, you couldn't fix and you didn't want to have to draw fade curves everywhere. This does it for you automatically. You can run this in real time. You can process this. It really sounds good. And frankly, the compressor, it just sounds, it sounds really nice on, on vocals. I happen to like this in particular on dialogue. Like I said, for music, it's, it's a little, it's not quite as mm, for, for me, but, um, but it can be. Try it. You may like it. You may love it. So my friends, that is very cool. Oh, and the very last thing. Oh my God, I almost forgot. Just have to tell you, I have to just show you here. Control surface support. We now have the full array of devices supported, including Yukon, Mackie control, and the most standard Mackie Huey, human user interface. You can even say I was just working with my Presonus fader port recently. Um, so Mackie Huey support in Audition, so great. Pretty much every controller out there supports Mackie Huey. Connect it up and control Audition, automate your mixes, do amazing things. And these are just, these innovations are being brought to you since April. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about, my friends. That's what we're doing here at Adobe. So we went 30 minutes over. <laughs> Thanks for sticking around. I hope some of you stick, stuck around. Oh, you did, okay. Well, in any case, you'll be able to watch the replay uh, right here on the Creative Cloud Facebook page, as well as on YouTube, on the Creative Cloud YouTube channel within a day or so. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Be sure to tune in to our Facebook properties over the next five days, as myself, Carl Soule, and many of our customers, I believe some, possibly, I'm not exactly sure, we will be live streaming from the booth. So you'll be able to get to see more. If you missed any of this here, you want a quick 25 minute, what's new in Premiere, what's new in After Effects, what's new in Audition, post-production, I recommend watching those. They begin at uh, 10.30 a.m. That's uh, uh, Netherlands time tomorrow, and we'll go all the way through Tuesday of next week. So thanks again for joining me. My name is Jason Levine. Be sure to uh, you know, continue to write some questions and comments. We've got our Adobe people on the West Coast where it is only 10.30 in the morning sticking around, and we will see you again next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.